Hello, all of you. This is the recorded session of today's class. And uh, yesterday we saw fascism. I gave you some examples also what how they compare certain present regimes to fascist states and how it's not perfectly all right to say so. Uh, today I'll talk about another related concept. Now you have already told you about it. Now before uh, there is another, there are more ideologies, but then there is something called uh, end of ideology or history. It's actually an essay by Francis Fukuyama. It was published in 1989. And then he also wrote a book, the same title. And he has proclaimed that uh, liberalism is end of history. So why he says so? Because he thinks that whatever we are witnessing, whatever we are seeing around us in terms of political ideology is just a mere repetition. That is, it's only a repetition so he would say that uh, the current happenings uh, it, it actually it was the end of cold war almost events were happening so that's why he said that uh, it is an uh, current happenings uh, like uh, the end of cold war there were three two incidences that accompanied it fall of berlin wall and disintegration of ussr these are the reasons attributed for the end of cold war okay you will read in history how germany got united after the fall of berlin wall it happened in 86 like yes 86 or 87 so he said that uh, now liberalism has won okay and this victory is final it is the end of ideological evolution which means this victory of liberalism because uh, these two incidents communism is over and then liberalism democracy are victorious okay so western form of liberal democracy is final form of government this is what the end of history says that with the end of these two incidences cold war has ended communism has been defeated so liberalism and democracy have won and now this victory is final there will not be any ideological evolution it's not like liberalism will turn into something else so this is here to stay this is end of history okay there will not be any further evolution in terms of uh, uh, ideologic ideology and liberalism has become supreme usa has also become supreme the liberal democracy that it is this is what end of uh, ideology debates is now fukuyama also adds that uh, end of history means end of events no it isn't end of events but events will keep on happening but uh, liberal democracy has been established so means there might be some uh, a revolution anywhere a communist monarch might come or maybe a dictator would come such events might happen but this is here to stay forever so it is an acknowledgement that liberal democracy has been established now and it is a there is no better alternative so there might be a china that has survived a cuba or a north korea but soon they will also see liberal democracy when we don't know but there is no better alternative to liberal democracy that's why it will come everywhere okay now different people react differently to this end of history like uh, this guy Derrida, D E R R I D A. Like he says that Fukuyama has a mission to. That's why he's saying th certain things. So supremacy of West means the liberal democracies will survive. Okay. Now this guy Samuel P. Huntington. We have quoted him earlier also. Now he said that uh, he said that uh, he has claimed something like clash of civilization and a remaking of world order they, this he wrote at length in 1996 okay now fukuyama himself says he modified his view three years to four years back he said that uh, liberalism would have been final but the way it was practiced was not all right okay liberalism would have uh, been end of history but wrong policies of usa okay especially he's critical about george bush okay has uh, kind of uh, created challenges for American supremacy. And America is the cradle of liberalism. That's why we wrote earlier that uh, Western democracy survive, liberalism survives, which means America survives. And if they are greatest, then automatically America becomes greatest. So that's what they are saying. He says that the wrong policies that he followed, uh, that has actually, that are to be blamed actually, because uh, otherwise there was not an issue. 
but these people have kind of uh, followed all the wrong policies and uh, they have uh, that's why the american democracy the western democracy is kind of uh, not being uh, final and decisive there might be some improvisement now let us see what are those things what is this clash of civilization very interesting the clash of civilization american hegemony is challenged okay so throughout there has been uh, clashes now he has mentioned many kind of civilization but he says that there are kind of two main two main conflicts that are happening right now fault line conflict and this he attributes to the clash between uh, liberal world and islamic world and second he says historic conflict no it's it's actually a part like first one is uh, your fault line conflict uh, now there are other major conflicts like uh, that are not fault line conflicts usa versus china you see the american president openly saying chinese virus so let us try to understand what is a uh, uh, fault line conflict here he says west and islam share bloody borders they are marred with blood okay so christianity that is in the west and islam are missionary okay both are against non believer islam has that concept of kafir and both christianity also has not kafir there is some other term in all or nothing you can be with them or not so this is a very extremist view okay so what is the uh, reason for uh, uh, he has given this reasons for islamic fundamentalism and then he says the lack of democracy in middle east then unemployment is there some of the middle eastern countries are having him unemployment then the population is too much uh, expansion of western culture is making kind of uh, youth youth in uh, islamic countries frustrated okay and both of them were arc rivals of communists pits them against each other so islamists were also not fond of communists and of course the liberals the christians were not now american support to mujahids you know the afghanistan story if not uh, i'll tell you mujahids i'll tell you some day in afghanistan against ussr okay so that is what he says this is what he says but he believes that this is not major Huntington said that this isn't major con- major challenge as Islamic world has no core state. So yesterday it was uh, Saudi, today it can be Iran or maybe Turkey. So that's not a defined territory that they have defined uh, kind of uh, core state, the territory that they can call, the government that they can call. So it keeps changing. So it's not a big challenge they are saying. It's not a very big challenge, you would say. So what is the big challenge? The big challenge is China. Okay. that is china core states and usa okay because uh, they are against each other but this guy uh, noam chomsky he has written a brilliant he has written so many books the one i like this manufacturing consent he blames media title is manufacturing consent so he believes that class of civilization that nothing like this is happening he says is an attempt it's a ploy under which an attempt is being made to strengthen american hegemony you have a full chapter in ncert class 12 which talks about american hegemony okay and it legitimizes us intervention everywhere that they are showing that china will come so i need to protect you or i need to interfere here so the, the, these are the few things that uh, this class of civilization uh, we often hear about so this is the entire debate okay that is going on there i hope you understood this now next thing i would like to tell you at least i would introduce that to you is feminism so it's kind of both ideology and movement both it is it is like an umbrella ideology you know what is umbrella ideology something like under which it devel- uh, several ideologies develop okay that is what uh, they say that feminism is not one ideology there are several ideologies between so how it happened what it talks about there are two basic beliefs two basic beliefs are here now of course uh, it it talks about uh, certain uh, ideological biasness first is okay so women are disadvantaged because of their sex and this disadvantage should be overthrown it should be done away with 
so they have highlighted what they see as a political relationship between the sexes the supremacy of men and the subjection of women in most if not all societies so they view gender division as political okay they they view uh, gender division as uh, this is the second one sorry should be what one as political they they challenge it that how can it go on and uh, they they say that uh, it has been characterized by a very diverse views and political positions uh, in due course of time and uh, there were many you know uh, like there were stages so the first one is your uh, first not stage is called first wave feminism first wave feminism now what was happening now there is this book this is considered to be a very sacred text of feminist mary bullstonecraft it is written in the backdrop of uh, french revolution okay what was the position of women at that time so here they they talk about in first wave they talk about uh, female suffrage that women must have right to vote here they will talk about uh, a right to vote female suffrage like uh, this was the main thing okay same you can say legal and political rights that men are given same legal and political rights like men they would say now this is called first wave feminism early form of feminism it is and it happened in the kind of mid uh, 19th century you can say mid 19th century so political and legal equality they are saying like men we should be also given some positions so on and so forth now it happened in us in 1814 it happened there is this famous seneca falls convention which was held in 1848 actually it marks the birth of slavery so us women right movement also started in the same year so this was okay okay thing like yes the the, the demands were very very legitimate and they ended up with the achievements like uh, they ended up uh, getting female suffrage so if i if we are to write first wave achievement the most and very rational would be that they were given the right to vote 1893 first time in new zealand it happened 1920 usa it happened it was actually the 19th amendment of the american constitution okay it happened uk it was in 1918 but it not 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 equal it was not equal they were given vote uh, voting right but it was not equal to men now this female suffrage uh, started there now again you know uh, it uh, kind of uh, some uh, activists believe and they were very naive to believe i can write that that uh, naively believe we can write because this does not happen did not actually materialize they were wrong the full emancipation was not guaranteed so because they were only given and here also in uk they was qualified not every woman can vote like all men could vote it was uh, conditional so now they thought that we need to do something more and here comes the second wave so what was the second wave and what it talked about uh this we need to see that what was this second wave and uh, what it talked about now here uh, there was again a book which came very important one the feminine mystique this was pretty written she said this now she will say from when i'm with no name and this was 1960s to 70s now what was this no name this was it frustration and uh, kind of unhappiness frustration and unhappiness women experience as they are confined confined to house they are uh, just like uh, confined to role of housewives okay and then they would say that because women are confined in the traditional role of looking after they are uh, uh, kind of uh, not being able to uh, do anything uh, on their own they are always supposed to look after their family so on and so forth these things uh, were said that she is a kind of a housewife and then she is a mother then she looks after the entire family so that means make makes them very very uh, not not un, uh, unsatisfied and then it leaves them frustrated and unhappy so what to do so here they would say that first wave did not achieve everything okay they will now uh, question that the first wave feminism thought that uh, we are actually done we are actually done with what we thought uh, but that's not happening first wave feminism by just gang 
uh, by granting uh, this suffrage did not end the end things the way they were supposed to end so they will say that no first wave was inadequate of course it did very important thing they 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 got uh, the right to vote but that was not enough they did not solve the women question now this book will come sexual politics this was very radical one in 1970 by kate billet okay and uh, there will be another book like the female even you know shikhandi mahabharat malik kafur so they were even this was written by germain yes germain greed now this will focus on uh, the you know both these books will kind of more radicalized this will actually uh, like earlier it was a political issue now they will say that it is personal it is uh, psychological and sexual also all these aspects will be emphasized sexual aspects of female oppression they would say this is what they will say now they will establish gender perspective as an important theme in a very range of academic disciplines and uh, in most of the countries the organizations will be established now they will also say that uh, you know another thing will come out of it that is uh, radical feminism it holds gender division to be most politically significant they would believe of all the social cleavages cleavages here means the uh, fault lines you can also write fault lines instead of this the gender division is most politically significant of all social cleavages now they will you know they will say that feminism is not an ideology uh, it's like a movement they will say they will see a uh, uh, and feminism will should be viewed as a subset of uh, liberalism and socialism at the point at which the basic values of theories of these two ideology can be applied to gender issues they will say so this is how they will define uh, their own uh, thing the second wave would define it now here we see a uh, liberal uh, feminist came and we have seen already what f- uh, first wave was all about and uh, second wave that it is called a radical feminist they would say that uh, you know all these uh, liberalism and socialism they would blame them also the uh, second wave of pe- uh, people second wave would very conveniently say that liberalism and socialism these two are also masculinist masculinistic discourse there is no originality of women these are masculinistic discourses this courses means narration narrative so all these uh, liberalism and uh, socialism of course uh, we can attach it with feminists because there were liberal feminists there were radical uh, socialist uh, lenin lenin would be considered uh, mao marx did not write much on women but uh, engels has written uh, in his book origin of family private property and state he wrote Frederick Angels Karl Marx friend I uh, have discussed it that he said that exploitation of women is linked with capitalistic mode of production that women should support communist revolution because uh, private property will end the exploitation of women is what angels would say Frederick Angels okay lenin sounded very progressive about women and uh, he, it was the first cabinet his cabinet where a uh, women was women was got a rank of minister but then a reversal happened when stalin came to power and stalin was very traditional approach toward women he 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 was not very fond of this so liberal feminist concerned with civil and political rights social feminist were concerned with uh, social social and economic rights of women the socialist feminist so that is what the second wave would say that you guys are masculinistic discourses you are engaged in okay your liberal and marxist or socialist is not going to do uh, uh, what we want radical feminism is feminist discourse is the real essence okay we they will say that we should not uh, kind of uh, not use concepts of liberalism and marxism and marxism or socialism both are almost same you know this so they will develop their own concept based on the situation of women now own concepts they will come up with like uh, they will distinguish between they will difference there will be according to there is a difference between sex and gender we'll see these things they will come up with uh, hierarchy they will come up with uh, a concept called differentiated citizenship differentiated citizenship they will talk about and then personal is political this has come in your exam this statement is given in comment section for 10 marks okay
Okay, so apart from few names, some more names you can write for second wave. Simon D. B. O. R. Q. V. O. R. Her book is Second Sex. This is the book. This is the author. Feminine Mystique, you have already written. Betty Friedan. Kate Millett, Sexual Politics. And uh, there's this again famous one. Against Our Will. Suzanne Brown Miller. Okay, so these were the prominent ones. who were kind of uh, getting into it. Getting into the forms of uh, radical feminism. and they were like no we want uh, they would uh, say that we need this we we need this uh, form uh, kind of uh, the discourse needs to be changed they would say that uh, the discourse needs to be changed and how will it change it will change only when you know uh, the the women oriented issues will come to the forefront now this betty fidden the feminist mystique the this book is considered as the mother of feminism feminine mystique book by betty fidden now she conducted interviews on white women who were uh, well off families who came from a well off families like we can say uh, we can write this also else you will forget betty fidden you the book name you already know mother, uh, feminine mystique so she found that even rich white women were not happy she she conducted few interviews many interviews and uh, and they were not able to tell the reason like you have money you have a family okay that is why problem with no name like you have money you have family you have uh, plenty of clothes to wear plenty of food to eat you can do what you want but you don't have what is called the ability to take decisions or to engage in things that you wish to okay and she says that the problem is then she identifies the problem that we live in we live in gendered society she would say it means a particular gender has privileges and other is at disadvantage or the second at disadvantage so this is where the thesis on patriarchy would emerge okay so even after civil and political rights social and economic rights we do not see the discrimination ending against women so how will that end discrimination against women will end only when we can change the patriarchal structure of the society okay so what is patriarchy we need to know this what is patriarchy like for any communist i have told this to you when we were discussing communism all the problems in the world are because of capitalism and private property and similarly for any feminist all the problem in the world is because of patriarchy so what is patriarchy i say it with some special effects because uh, it is the cause of all the problems so there has to be some effect rule by father not mother that's the problem often used to describe uh, the dominance of men and subjugation subjugation means subordinate second fiddle uh, oppressing so subjugation of women in society this is what is patriarchy very bad thing it is okay so i'm leaving it here i'll continue uh, from here in the next class